Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data Webinar Series with Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss natural language processing from chatbots to artificial understanding with Effective I.O. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag smart data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book in, on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SU New York Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon, and welcome to everybody with us today. I hate to be the one that uh, interrupts the David Bowie concert. That's, that's like being the last speaker before lunch. But maybe we can uh, you know, take a break in the middle and play a few more tunes. Anyway, today we're going to talk about natural language processing. And I really want to kind of expand the lens, if you will, to look at the whole field of communications and what's happening with uh, human, sorry, human computer interfaces and some of the technologies that are evolving to make them more personal. So before I get into the slides, I'd like to take just a minute to ask you to think about something. Just imagine, what's the favorite app on your phone? And then think about what your favorite possession is. I hope it's not the app. And your favorite person. And think for just a second about what makes them your favorite or what makes them special. You know, one's a piece of software, one's a physical thing, one's a person. Often the common thread in what makes something special to us is how it makes us feel. That there's some communication or some understanding of us that feels very personal. It could be something about the interface that gives us information in a way that's pleasing to us. It could be you know, in the possession uh, that it brings back a memory. There's some uh, context there for why you like it. And with a person, often it's um, how they make you feel, how they've uh, treated you in the past. But the common thread, really, tends to be the interface between us and the person or thing. It's how we communicate with them, how we interact with them. And that's a big part of what we want to talk about today. So let's dive right in. Got a pretty simple agenda here. I'm going to uh, set the stage with my thoughts on what natural language is and maybe uh, change the boundaries from what you're used to if you're uh, studying computer science. And then talk about natural language processing basics, uh, the difference between natural language understanding and natural language generation and how they work with each other. Get a basic understanding of why it's so difficult for machines to handle natural language um, effectively. And then get into kind of the meat of it. What's uh, going on today in terms of uh, tools and services to help you build natural language interfaces? Going from the fundamental, the bottom up, from simple chatbots to real conversational uh, solutions. And then I'll have a few words on getting started. So here we go. What is natural language anyway? If you uh, just take a, a language class in school and college and high school, uh, you may have taken a language other than English. And I know that we have many people that uh, participate in these webinars whose 
first language isn't English, so I apologize in advance if I, I start with an English-centric uh, view of the world. But basically a natural language we think of as uh, a human language like English, French, German, uh, where to learn a language, you need to have a vocabulary, you need to understand some syntax, some rules for how to construct parts of speech, and semantics. So syntax is um, the structure, and semantics is the meaning. And that's typically what we look at when we look at uh, uh, an introduction to a new language. If you're writing uh, compilers or interpreters for um, computer languages, that's really where all your focus is, because you have a very well-defined vocabulary, words that can and cannot be used. Uh, syntax, the structure in a programming language is very um, predictable, if you will. It's either syntactically correct or not. And the semantics uh, that you map to the structures to understand what's being said. Now, in natural language, when we're having a conversation or when we're reading something that's been written, there's usually more than just the words, and that's where it gets a little tricky. So I don't want to think about uh, a language as a mechanism for communication between humans, typically, that will capture and convey meaning. So as I'm speaking to you today, hopefully I'm uh, speaking within the bounds of normal English. I will try to keep it syntactically correct. Uh, but the issue sometimes gets into semantics and a little beyond semantics when I am speaking from a frame of reference that we may not share, what I'm saying may not be what you're hearing. The actual words, of course, uh, assuming a reliable communication mechanism, you're hearing the words, but my intent uh, may be colored by what I'm thinking. So here, the, the couple of pictures that I just added, the picture of the theater in Chicago. If you've been to Chicago, if you've been to that area and you see that, you instantly know more than the word Chicago conveys. It gives you a context, it gives you a neighborhood, uh, maybe it reminds you of the, uh, the Broadway show, but it's more than just me saying Chicago. The word telephone on the telephone booth, by itself, that's just a simple description. It's, it's a noun, telephone. But if you see that, uh, it probably conveys instantly that the picture was taken in the UK. It's much more than just the words. So the context around the words may not be part of the formal language. There's no syntax or semantic for the image that goes with it. But when we have a conversation, we generally have much more than words that are being exchanged. And that's what I want to get into today, to help understand how we can uh, improve our interfaces to improve our communication so that uh, we can convey much more than the words alone. So when we think about it, uh, sometimes I'm glad that I'm not on video here, but it would be nice if you could see that as I'm speaking, I'm gesturing. I'm not sure it's adding anything to the value here, but in many cases when you're having a conversation, just the animation of someone's body language will change the way you interpret their words. So gestures, you may have specific gestures, you may have specific symbols, the heart symbol there, the thumbs up, that are nonverbal communication. Uh, my feeling is that if you can put those in the context of a language, then we should just be able to think of that as being an extension to the language itself. So there are some uh, gestures that are benign in one culture and offensive in another. To me, that, uh, that's as much a part of the language as the words themselves. And as we go through this, I want you to uh, consider the words of uh, General Michael Hayden, who is the former director of the CIA and NSA. And he said to his staff, his senior staff at both places, that you're not just responsible for what you say, you're responsible for what people hear. And I think that's a, an important thing when we start to look at um, 
interfaces and conversational interfaces going beyond simple stimulus response. It's very easy to have misunderstandings in natural language and look at some of the causes for those. But as we start to build systems that are conversational in nature, it's going to be very important to be able to assure, uh, to some extent, that what you are saying uh, can only be interpreted in one way uh, for the person that you're communicating with. So now we're talking about uh, using human language between person and machine rather than person to person. And so keep that in mind and let's take a look. How do we actually communicate? It's much more than words. There are things that uh, we assume uh, probably without even thinking about it. So if I send you a text at 2 o'clock in the morning and we are um, close enough that you have a special tone for my text as I have for my children so that uh, I ignore just about everybody else. But if I get a text at 2 o'clock in the morning, my first assumption is, I mean, it's a fact that I got a text. Before I've even read it, that tone, I start to think something bad has happened. I have to get from the fact that there's a, a text to reading the text to understand the concepts and uh, just as important, the intent of the person that sent it. So this is where we get into sort of the, the negotiation phase of natural language. And when we try and do this in an automated fashion, uh, actually the, the text example is person to person via um, natural language, if you will, rather than a system sending me that. But it's the same principle. When we start to do this for uh, natural language processing with a computer, we have to be able to filter out and augment, if you will, what's being um, received with what's being, what, what the intent was of the sender. <coughs> Excuse me. So very briefly, in, in terms of natural language processing, we break it up into two parts, understanding and generation. And a lot of the work that's been done in the, the first 50 or 60 years of AI was focused on natural language understanding. And this is where it probably would help because if you could see me speaking right now, you'd see that I was giving air quotes to the word understanding. Uh, as we talk about this and I say that something is understood, in the mechanical sense, if it's uh, an application or a service that's understanding it, it may not be done in the way that it's done for humans, but I contend that that doesn't matter. So we need to take a look and see what's the process here, and then how can we extend it to understand the affect uh, of the, on the input uh, and provide some affect or some tone on the output. There we go. So in a simple model here, we've got uh, the system in the middle, which is our natural language interface, or it's an application that has a natural language interface, and it's bidirectional. It doesn't always have to be that way. We can have uh, systems where you just have voice input, for example, or text input, uh, that you don't get uh, corresponding text output. But for the moment, we're going to look for a complete bidirectional duplex, if you will, uh, conversation. So coming in, we've got the text or we've got the voice and the voice is generally converted into text. Uh, you can think of that as being transparent at some point because that's, that's a pretty well understood and um, reliable process. So it doesn't matter if we're getting the input in the form of voice or text. But what matters is that we may want to add to it so we can capture more than just the voice. But right now, let's get the words in. We're going to analyze it. We're going to represent it and we're going to put it in a form where we can take some action on it. And that's what the model is all about. How do we represent the, our understanding of what's coming in? How do those words fit with each other? How do they fit with what we know about the world? And then we're going to use that model and the context and all of our historical data to generate an appropriate response. So we're analyzing on the input and we're synthesizing on the output. That's a generalization. You know, we may have a simple system that 
the input can only be one of 10 possibilities, and anything that the user puts in, we try to map to one of those 10 requests within a domain, and maybe we only have five actions that we can take. But at a higher level, a little bit more abstract, we would like to be able to say, okay, tell me what you're thinking, I will process it, and within my uh, understanding of the world, I'll give you an appropriate answer. So why is this so difficult? Well, it's difficult because uh, language, natural language, is inherently ambiguous. I don't know of any natural language that uh, doesn't allow any ambiguity. Whereas a programming language, um, by design, by definition, you're constrained enough, there is no ambiguity. So in English, we have rules, right? Like two negatives always make a positive. If I say that is not an uncommon occurrence, it's a negation of a negation. So if I say it's not an uncommon occurrence, then we can interpret that as it's a common occurrence. But we have a rule in English that two positives don't make a negative, except it's not formal, but in the case of sarcasm, you get the person that will give you the yeah, right answer. That's two positives, and it's clearly a negative. So there are uh, things within the language whether it's structural or uh, by the inflection. If you have people um, that raise the pitch at the end of a sentence, it generally turns something into a question in English. <coughs> Excuse me again. So there are things that are in the book that we learn. Uh, there are rules for how we process this, but we recognize that in real life, there are regional differences, there are dialect differences, and there are experiential differences that make people interpret things uh, slightly differently from the way the rules would indicate. And so to be complete and to be accurate uh, is one thing, but to be um, useful in real life, your system needs to go beyond the formal rules. So when we look at uh, natural languages, we have grammar theories. I talked about how a language has vocabulary, uh, syntax, and semantics, and that's where you get into the grammar. But there are a lot of different options there. You know, we can have a generative grammar, a system of rules that will uh, allow you to specify all the sentences that you can possibly generate. Uh, this is typically how we, we specify programming languages. If you look at like the BNF or uh, whatever your favorite programming language is. But then the reality is that in conversation, we often have things that aren't, strictly speaking, um, valid sentences. And yet, uh, they, they're they easy for a human to understand because we can start to make substitutions. We can have things that are fuzzy, and uh, when we start to try and fill in and say, okay, well, uh, in a programming language, it's very straightforward. We can generally predict what the next type of uh, token is going to be. In a, a um, natural language, we may, with experience, uh, be able to recognize that the next thing is going to be a verb and figure out what it's likely to be. Uh, that's going to be different in different languages. The position of verbs in English is very different from where they are in German. but. Because these languages are ambiguous, and because even with the ambiguity, we don't speak precisely in most cases, things like a cultural difference or sarcasm or metaphors or even a pause are going to be interpreted by a human to have meaning. And so with a uh, computer natural language um, system, we need to account for those. And just one last thought on the, the, the grammar part of it. So if we have uh, something like this, and this is um, a simple structural representation for how you do an address, it's very easy to, um, to process this in the computer if the person has put in complete, consistent, unambiguous information. It's very easy for a human to process it even with some missing information because they know what to look for. So the idea is that computationally, uh, the human is doing a lot of work that you don't even maybe recognize that you're doing, but it has to be uh, programmed explicitly 
into a system if we're going to be able to have the same level of conversation. So how do people do it? First of all, they understand things in context. They understand your frame of reference. Uh, you have to be able to resolve ambiguity, which uh, if I start talking about um, Bob and then later I refer to he, you know that the last uh, mail that I referred to was Bob, and so you pull it together and say, okay, well, he probably refers to Bob. We still sometimes get into uh, to a messy situation, but we use our knowledge about the person who's speaking, if I'm trying to do the understanding. What we know about the speaker and the context is how we filter that input. And we also use these visual cues to distinguish between what was said and what was meant, to use Michael Hayden's words. So uh, there's a commercial on TV right now for one of the um, cable companies. And the person installing the system says, oh yeah, you can get that. Meanwhile, he's shaking his head no. And you re recognize that what they're saying and the point of the ad is, okay, you may be led to believe that you can get these things, but you can't. And so that's the, the physical cue, the, the visual cue. One of the things that we try to do uh, when we're having difficulty in, um, particularly if there's a language difference or a cultural difference or an age difference, is to use pictures that may be more abstract than the words, but convey the meaning very easily. So uh, this is one of my favorites, is uh, uh, father of three sons, a frequent visitor to emergency rooms. I've seen this diagram many times. When uh, kids are uh, in the emergency room, or actually it's often used for, uh, for people who don't speak the language of the emergency room, they're asked to point to the picture that relates to the severity of their pain, right? So is it a mild, moderate, severe, et cetera? And that's all well and good. The problem with that is that two people pointing to the same picture may have very different levels of pain. The diagram isn't calibrated in any way to tell you that. So in this case, I have two sons here, and I can tell you that if they both pointed to a six, I would be alarmed with one and not with the other because they have different thresholds of pain. And unless you know that, the word and the picture are going to be misleading. So I'm going to say one more thing about the idea of understanding, and then we'll, uh, we'll go on to some of the technologies. Again, I think it's very important when we're talking about artificial intelligence to at least subconsciously, every time I say understanding, uh, insert the word artificial, because the way we understand things as humans, the way this knowledge is captured, codified, and stored, and acted upon in our brain, uh, is not necessarily, and not likely, and in general it is not, the way we're going to handle that representation in software. It's very different. We're not dealing with uh, models of um, neurons and uh, sorry, the, your hierarchical uh, temporal memory. Uh, there are some attempts to do that, but for the purposes of today's discussion, nothing in terms of the capture and codification and use of knowledge uh, refers to a biological model. It doesn't have to. So the fact that uh, information is stored differently and manipulated differently uh, it just means that it's a different type of understanding, and we use understanding to represent the concept that we have captured some essential information about the input in a way that we can use to make productive use of it uh, to create context-relevant output. Okay, so that's what I'm dealing with with understanding. And that's important because there are two, uh, at the extremes, there are two fundamental approaches to designing virtually any kind of uh, AI system, but we're gonna focus on uh, natural language processing today. And at the extremes, we're dealing with either symbolic logic or statistical models. We're either trying to represent some abstract properties uh, in a symbolic logic fashion where they can be uh, subjected to the rules of formal logic, um, 
primarily deductive, inductive, or abductive reasoning, and those concepts. So to use that sort of uh, modeling, we have to have an abstract representation of these concepts. To do something that's purely statistical, all we're looking for is relationships between words, symbols, uh, higher level constructs uh, that can be mathematically modeled. And that's an important distinction. The, the fact that we can identify these relationships based purely on a numerical representation, a mathematical representation, uh, may be very useful, even if it has nothing to do with the way humans are making the same um, the same type of judgment about what something means. And I'll give you an example. So this one is from um, Loop AI Labs. I've uh, been using this for a couple of years, and uh, the proprietary and confidential doesn't apply. We have permission to use this. But basically, this is a representation of uh, some text in an Al Jazeera <coughs> excuse me, uh, publication. And they've pulled out concepts. And even if you just recognize the numbers, if you're a frequent flyer, you may start to recognize that these are all related to aircraft. There are some uh, Boeing aircraft and some uh, Airbus aircraft. And in fact, all the text refers to um, air travel relationships or air travel um, nouns. And what's interesting about this is that this was analyzed by a system that made no attempt to understand the underlying language. It was looking for, it was representing the symbols mathematically and then looking for the relationships between them and trying to identify concepts based on usage. And so pulling it out. So I would say that uh, concepts were recognized, they were discovered, but in the terms that we would normally associate with natural language. They weren't understood. But in terms of being useful to provide um, analysis that could be used to um, direct some output, it's absolutely understood in those terms. The alternative is to use something like um, a representation of the language constructs itself. And so here I've just got uh, WordNet from Princeton, which is one of the larger um, publicly available volumes that has uh, understanding of the English language and how words uh, relate to each other, what parts of speech they are, how they're used, the definitions, et cetera. And in fact, this has been used uh, for years on many large projects. So rather than just look for the statistical relationships, now we're trying to ascribe some meaning. So that's the difference between what we think of as symbolic logic and statistical, or what some people refer to as sub-symbolic approaches. Uh, one example here that combines both of them uh, using uh, what's called deep QA or question answering was IBM and Watson that did the analysis, uh, if you're familiar with how Watson was uh, configured for the game of Jeopardy, it had to do analysis of natural language um, answers. In the Jeopardy game, you get an answer and you have to figure out what it means and then figure out what's the question that fits with it. So in this case, it was looking for those relationships. And I point this out only because it used a combination of the statistical modeling and the um, symbolic modeling to come up with a representation to guide the next step. So let's get into how all of this fits with conversational interfaces. This is where we're going. Uh, if you, today you've got a, maybe a Alexa or a, an Amazon Echo or a Google Home or one of those devices or you use um, apps on your phone with Siri, You've got something that is taking in uh, speech and representing it in a way that that can drive some action. And the action may be to do something or it may be to produce um, a conversational output. Normally, these things are sort of single cycle. You ask a question, you get an answer. What we're getting to is uh, more persistent conversations but they're still generally uh, pretty circumscribed in terms of the domain. So we don't have something that can answer questions about everything. 
uh, in general conversation, probably uh, Watson for Jeopardy was the closest to that because it was multi-domain. But here we have just the input and the output. We're going to take in text, speech, and ge gestures, predominantly uh, text today, and output either narrative text, maybe a story we tell based on the data uh, that can be um, speech to text, or um, sorry, text to speech, because internally it's stored as uh, a text representation anyway, or maybe haptics. You may, if you're dealing with like a game controller or something, you're gonna get physical feedback. So this is where we wanna go with the, the central uh, processing, if you will, the understanding, reasoning, and learning, which is the core for um, cognitive systems, that's in the middle. What I wanna look at now is where this is going in the future, um, or where we are today and, and where it's going. So this is the interface for an application. Sometimes that's gonna be completely separate. Sometimes that's gonna be the logic at the boundary between you and the application. And so, We'll uh, take a look now at the, uh, the domain of chatbots, and in particular what I call an AI chatbot. So the chatbot today is the new user experience or customer experience that can, for practical purposes, make or break your enterprise. If you think back to the uh, first question I asked, thinking about the applications that you like uh, or the things that you, you value, uh, having something that's very personalized and can respond to you in a way that basically tells you that it understands what you mean, uh, that is very valuable. But not all chatbots are equal. So the simple chatbot here, we've got voice or text coming in, it doesn't matter because uh, the, as I say, the, the process for identifying uh, parts of speech and trans transforming uh, verbal input into text input is uh, almost trivial at this point. I don't want to spend any time on it. So what's coming in gets um, analyzed. We break it down and look for syntax and structure, et cetera. Then we have some representation of what came in. And then the system, which may all be within the chatbot or maybe uh, within the application here, we have to say, okay, what was it, what are you asking for? And can I answer you? And if we assume for the moment that we can, then we're going to respond by generating or selecting a response. So that's the simple chatbot. With an AI chatbot, <coughs> uh, the distinction I make here is that the chatbot part, the interface, if you will, can learn from experience. So every time it provides a response, it evaluates what happens next to understand the quality of the response and it uses that to um, either reinforce the internal system, say, yes, that was a good response, I'll keep doing that, or maybe uh, recognize that I thought that I had answered the question, but now there's another question that comes, so maybe I didn't answer it, and start to update the model. And all of this, uh, if we think of it as a chatbot, is separate from the application itself and the data. So I can put all of this as a front end to something the application could be something, um, basically any system. It could be your enterprise, um, your ERP system. It could be a help system. But we've, we've sort of pulled it out and have the interface separately. As the complexity of the interface, um, as it gets more complex, if we try to have a broader domain, for example, then we're getting away from the chatbot and we're building a conversational interface right into the application. And for that, I want to just give you a uh, kind of an overview of the landscape. So chatbots fall into the first, uh, the bottom two rows here, right? We've got um, a responsive system where it's a stimulus response. That's a, a pretty dumb chatbot, if you'll forgive me, where there's a limited number of possible stimuli Maybe this is a system for um, handling customer service for your telephone company, for your um, your cell phone. And so the only things it can do are is answer questions about changing service, upgrading, discontinuing, maybe 10 things. And for each of those 10, once I figure out that that's what you're asking, I have a prescribed response. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your circumstances, if you ask me to 
um, discontinue something, I'm going to go through that routine. <coughs> so these are, are the, the basics, if you will. The smarter ones are where we try to uh, build something that's actually going to have a conversation or a debate. There's going to be that interaction. Today, even the, the smarter ones in this space are generally um, restricted by domain. Uh, long term, we're, we're getting to uh, the situation that we can have something that, that's more open-ended. But they're context-based, and we can have something that's non-deterministic. And what I mean by that in this context is that if I get an input and I'm the, the chatbot interface to uh, another application, I can, based on my experience with data, with other users, with other scenarios, with other questions, historical data, based on that, plus what I'm getting now as my current input, I have a wide range of outputs, and I may not just be responding uh, to that stimulus, I may be generating something new. And that's where we're gonna get into some of the uh, natural language generation. And so these are, are more um, applicable for complex systems where there's a, uh, a, a deeper or persistent conversation. You're not just asking for one thing, you're asking for things uh, the way you would have in a conversation. And frankly, this could be uh, things that are diagnostic in nature. So maybe I, I ask you a question because I think that's the question that's gonna get me to the answer. But in a real conversational system, if uh, this is the front end for a system with a deeper knowledge than the user may have, I may have to ask you a question in order to get the information I need to provide the answer to the question that you asked. That gets into the what did you ask, what did you need? Uh, and I always go back to my abnormal psychology professor who said, you have to determine first of all, who has the problem and who's paying the bill. The person that's asking the question may not have all the information and may not have the context, um, so you have to be able to provide that ongoing conversation. The innovative uh, level, which is above um, chatbots, is where we're going, I think, in terms of conversational interfaces beyond chatbots. So something where we can actually create some content, uh, something novel that hasn't been seen before rather than selecting it or identifying it. And these things tend to be, um, tend to require more attention to the algorithms that are used than the data. So today the, uh, the prevailing trend in AI is to use a lot of data to train a system and have the system learn from experience with data. Whereas in past years, uh, or in the early days, certainly uh, there's less emphasis on large bodies of data and it was more emphasis on having the expertise or the, uh, the expert knowledge put in the system. You get back to that if you're trying to come into a system that's going to be more innovative. And so the sweet spot for chatbots today, those first two levels, are when we're building them as an interface to an app where the domain is fairly specific and the task or the um, set of tasks are fairly specific. So in this example, a pharma chatbot for customer service at, at your uh, local CVS. If you wanted to expand along either dimension, either um, opening it up so that the same app, the same chat um, facility would be useful for these types of services in a different domain, maybe we have a, a customer service for a different business than a pharmacy, that's generally more straightforward than uh, adding to the tasks within it. But gradually, as you start to go up on either of those dimensions, you get towards the requirements for artificial general intelligence. And frankly, we're just not there yet. So looking at the... Uh, the market today, we've got sort of consumer focus versus business focused um, markets. And these are some of the, the leaders in the space. Uh, not surprisingly for uh, the enterprise, if you're, you're business focused, um, the four major firms in the um, cloud services market, so Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and IBM, all have services 
that are available via their, their cloud platforms to allow you to build uh, a chatbot or a conversational interface. For the consumer, where you're not going to be building it yourself, um, three of the leaders, Apple, Amazon, and Google, have the lower functionality, if you will, uh, chatbots available now, uh, but you're not going to be doing much customization on them. Where it gets interesting to me is as these things start to, to merge and we start to see things like using um, building systems uh, for the enterprise that end up being deployed in such a way that you can access them via a consumer product. So uh, I just did a, an interview and there's a video about it um, online where uh, I was talking to the C, C, sorry, CTO for Watson's uh, platform and, and partnerships <coughs> about um, solutions that IBM is working on with Apple where you can build a model using IBM Watson and some of their visual um, analytics and then deploy it on Apple iOS. So it's not using Siri, but it, it's combining the technologies for um, uh, Core ML on the Apple platform with Watson uh, in the cloud to build something that can be deployed mobily. So these things are starting to converge, which to me is kind of the exciting part of uh, the business. We uh, go through the next few pretty quickly. Um, getting into the idea of perceptive input, this, this is where we really change and start to look at affect. So now the, the key, uh, key to this diagram is that human input, if I have a, an interaction with you in person, you have all your senses available. You can see, you can hear, you can um, get the words that I'm saying, but also the context, uh, and obviously you have other, other senses. So that's what, what's actually there, but what's derived that we have to capture in this model is an understanding what do these gestures, what do these words mean in terms of emotion? What concepts are there? What's the intent? And all of that has to go on the input. And today it's fairly, um, fairly common at this point to analyze text for tone. Each of the, uh, the cloud players has, uh, has these services. I'm just using the IBM example here. It could be any one of them. But the idea is that by looking at the text, you can analyze the emotional tone based on um, a model of the words. Again, this could be done with either a symbolic model or a statistical model or a hybrid. But when you start to do that, you get more uh, a richer understanding, and again, air quote understanding. So we look at things like tone, uh, emotion, visual, and then on the output side, expressive text to speech. There was an interesting thing at uh, Google I.O. recently, uh, talking about one of their advances in natural language processing, which was when you have a signal that is uh, people talking over each other, this is uh, one of the examples they used, um, it's very difficult for computers in general to pull out one signal from another and understand uh, how these work. This has been a long been a problem with uh, natural language understanding, but Google has done a really good job and demonstrated this, that it can pull it out and isolate. And so you can uh, have multiple speakers being processed at the same time, but if you're listening, you can actually filter out and just listen to the one. That brings me to understanding emotion in both um, the tone of voice and in facial expressions. And one of the companies that I track on a regular basis for this is a company called Affectiva, which is a spin out of the MIT Media Lab. And they've done a lot of work uh, recently using um, deep neural networks to identify the tone or the, the emotion of a person speaking, not based on the words, but based on uh, using classifiers to look at how they are speaking. And that's, um, that's something that, again, goes beyond the words. I mean, you can look at a set of words and say, yeah, these are angry words, but you can say uh, words in a way that words you might think of as neutral, but the way it's spoken would lead a human um, 
uh, <laughs> a participant in the conversation to understand that the person is angry. This is really important when you're trying to do things like customer service. Uh, it's one thing when you're dealing with uh, fully automated, but even with human um, call centers, sometimes there's that misunderstanding. And so now this type of technology is being used in call centers to guide the human uh, call center operator to better understand the, um, the context and, and the emotion of the person calling in. The other uh, example that I use here from uh, Affectiva is in when we talk about gesture and body language, they were one of the pioneers in um, doing facial emotion detection. So it's uh, similar to the range of emotions that I showed with uh, IBM that was doing it based on the text. Here, this is an example where as you, um, if you opt in, as you're watching something, a video that in this case happened to be a Budweiser commercial with a puppy, um, you allow your computer camera to capture your face and it will track your emotions. Obvious uh, implication is you can use something like this to calibrate TV commercials or other things, but the basic technology can now be used in a conversational system. So as we're having a conversation, if the person at the other end isn't a person, it's a bot or it's a human that's guided by technology, these things are getting much more accurate uh, to the point where you can use that to guide your response because you have a better understanding of the, uh, the context and frame it. And so one of the trends that I think is important as we talk about these, um, these new technologies is to offer emotion detection using visual analytics as a feature or a service. And we're going to see that a, pretty much everywhere, I'd say, in the next couple of years. Now, that's all been understanding on the input side. And we use that to create the model so that we understand the context. Now, in the simplest case, we will have a flat affect when we uh, give our response. But if we really want to make a system conversational and have it uh, have that personalized feeling, what you really want to be able to do is have the affect on the output. So we have to perceive, have the perception on the input, and apply the right affect on the output. So natural language generation, this is the application of AI technology to generate or produce context-appropriate message in a human readable or understandable form. It can be uh, um, text-to-speech. And it's the context that creates the value. So. This is something that can be done a, in a um, in batch mode, if you will, but we're getting to the point where it fits with conversational mode. So the point here is when we're getting into something that's going to generate rather than just select output, there are so many words. How do we find the right words or the right affect to produce the right result? And for that, the output has to go from the model where we understand where we've captured the concepts, the meaning, the intent. We know what the person wants. We know what they're looking for. And we have to give them an answer. And so now on the output, we're going to be using language, avatars, and text to speech to complement, this is a key, complement the tone of the input. You don't want to mirror it. If somebody starts shouting at you, your automated system, that's not an indication that you should be shouting back. There are systems out there now, you may have already tried things like Google Smart Reply, which will attempt to read emails and generate automatic responses for you. These are getting better. The key is that from a modeling standpoint, we've got uh, the data, that's what's coming in, and a model to help us interpret it, and now we're going to generate the appropriate output. And that can support a, uh, an emotion um, component for the output if the model uh, supports it. So a lot of things right now are at the stage where uh, the emphasis is on understanding the emotion of the input, but not on producing uh, something that is emotionally complementary. In general, it's selecting or trying to identify a path that will resolve the problem. But where we're going is a much more nuanced approach. And so I'll just 
mention here just a, a list of vendors that are doing work in this area. We've actually got a uh, report that I'm working on now. It'll be out in a couple of months. So if you're interested in this technology, do stay in touch. Right now, the major uses for natural language generation uh, are things like producing um, longer reports rather than um, being a conversational, but it's the same underlying technology that's identifying what's important. And instead of doing a long form output, what we're looking for is taking this and applying it in uh, conversational bursts. So this is an example from, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from a firm in North Carolina. One of their uh, clients is a basketball team. And the idea was they looked at the data. It wasn't conversational input. But it was the data that uh, put in the model and said, OK, uh, we can identify online season ticket holders that aren't using the tickets they're selling them and maybe give them an offer that will uh, help build loyalty. The same type of natural language generation for, for the output uh, could have been used or could be used if the input was coming directly from the, uh, the subscriber, the, the ticket holder. Uh, this one is from Narrative Science, a uh, number of ways that uh, their technology is being used now to generate uh, narrative from data. And all of the uh, dominant model for it today is looking from uh, structured data in, in a database. Uh, as long as the input is coming in and being transformed using this uh, understanding technology, this could be the basis for the next generation of output. And one more here that I want to uh, show. Neural behavioral animation. As we get to the point that we're uh, talking to machines and the machine has to have some uh, representation, there's something that we're looking at. One of the most interesting things that I've seen is this uh, animation that's based on a uh, neural model so that the face has an expression that's appropriate for the emotion that it's trying to convey. And this is still in the relatively early stages, but it makes a huge difference if you're talking to an avatar, uh, that the avatar looks like uh, they're speaking, looks like they, they are feeling the emotion that you want to convey uh, from the underlying model of what, what um, what emotion is appropriate in this context. So if you're trying to uh, smooth over a situation with a client that's angry at you, then maybe you'll pick a different avatar and have a different expression than if you are trying to sell someone who's on the fence and you're trying to have a, a more assertive um, dialogue. So all of this is, uh, is leading to this next generation. I'm going to uh, wrap up with just a couple more examples. Uh, one that you may have seen recently, Google Duplex, which was uh, demonstrated at Google I.O. about a month ago, two months ago. Uh, the examples that they used had Google Duplex um, within Google Assistant making telephone calls, um, unaided telephone calls to accomplish goals, like you tell your assistant to book a haircut for me next Tuesday. And the uh, Google Duplex technology could make the call, uh, negotiate the, uh, the transaction, and record it using uh, natural language, as I say, unassisted. But it knows, um, again with air quotes, when it's getting into a situation that it can't handle. And the important thing there is, although it, um, it looked it, it's very, um, very advanced and it was uh, an impressive demonstration, uh, they will tell you that um, Google Duplex at this point can't carry out general conversations. It's, it's not uh, meant to do that. It's meant to handle uh, or to, to represent you as an agent in certain types of transactions. Uh, the ethics of using something like this without uh, recognizing that it is a, uh, a bot or dubious. Google has said that uh, you know, that's not their intention. I think the, the issue is, from a technology standpoint, if you start to look at things like this and say, is this something that I want to build into my system, um, 
the use case for this was calling businesses that didn't have an automated system for negotiation because uh, the ideal situation is to have your automated agent call the other party's automated agent. So uh, there's no point in trying to have both automated agents speak in English when it would be more efficient and uh, more effective to have them speak in a standard machine language. But uh, this brings me to my, my last point here, which is if you're building systems like this and you're getting into a conversation, uh, and as I mentioned, one of the most common uses for them today is in call centers. You always have to consider an unresolved issue, which is when do you know that a conversation is going wrong? A lot of times if you're talking to someone, you recognize that uh, things are not going well and there are different cues and different actions that you can take. Uh, this just points to um, a paper that came out of Cornell in May uh, looking at detecting early signs uh, that indicate that a conversation is going to go bad based on some uh, structural elements. And I think this is the kind of research that, uh, that has great promise. We, we can often tell when something has gone bad. Uh, there are <laughs> signs besides the fact that somebody is hanging up or that they're asking the same question again and again. But research in this area, I think, is going to be very valuable in the future to help us to automate the process of um, bringing in or escalating, um, bringing in a different uh, human expert or even a, a bot with different expertise when a conversation uh, has elements that show that it's likely to go off the rails. So with that, I'm going to wrap up by saying the state of the, the art today is that emotion understanding is more mature than conversational generation with, with tone, but it's advancing so rapidly and there's already a, a plethora of um, tools and services out there that would allow you to build a simple chatbot as a front end. That at this point, almost any application uh, is going to have some part where the interface would be more intuitive or um, more natural or more personalized if you could have this natural language. And so the, the advice at this point is to start looking at these for your entire portfolio of applications. Um, deal with the, the vendors that are um, building the chatbot services right now uh, in many cases for specific applications like customer service or within specific domains, you can already get pre-built knowledge so that you don't even need to train some of these. But start looking because in the next couple of years, as they mature, uh, by experimenting now, you'll have an advantage uh, by the time they become second nature to your audience. And with that, and a minute or so left for questions. I'm going to hand it back to Shannon and I'd love to continue the conversation. If you don't, if you have questions now, it's great. If you don't, uh, this is how you can reach me. Adrian, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation and thanks to our attendees. If you've got any questions, we've got a couple minutes just to sneak one or one in here in the Q&A. Um, and just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. And next month, we are going to be talking about data scientists. Very mm. excited. <laughs> So I hope you can join us for that on July 12th. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time today. And, Adrian, thank you, as always. We will catch you on the flip side. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Take care.